Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's been a great summit, right? All right, so I got to do at least one plug. If anybody happens to be in the market for a Chevrolet, Buick, GMC, or Cadillac, certainly come by and see me after. I'll be glad to get you behind the wheel of that vehicle today. <laughs> All right, but that's not what we're talking about today. We're actually having a really a great discussion with some incredible thought leaders that are joining me here on stage around that question of what is the best way to build bridges between human resources and the rest of the company. And I want you to be thinking about that as our panelists are actually talking to some of the questions that I propose to them. And kind of come back, I'm looking, if I do my job right, I'm going to be able to be able to give you 10 minutes to be able to actually ask questions of this panel. And I want you to think about it in the context, what is the big, biggest disconnect? Where have we been missing in HR to be able to make sure that we are that valued partner? So with that, I want to go ahead and introduce our panelists, our distinguished panel. First and foremost, to my immediate left, is Melissa Harper, Senior Vice President, HR Innovations at Bayer. In this leadership role, Melissa is responsible for developing, transforming, and executing global talent strategies that drive a high-performance culture of innovation and inclusion at Bayer. Melissa brings her nearly 10 years of experience at Monsanto, acquired by Bayer, to lead enterprise-wide talent transformation. Through best-in-class operational capabilities and analytics, Melissa developed a global function at Monsanto responsible for attracting talent, development, ensuring an inclusive environment, shaping a digital culture, and delivering talent needs that align to the strategic business goals and preparedness for the future workforce. Please help me welcome Melissa. And next to Melissa, we all know Valerie Love, Senior Vice President, Human Resources, Coca-Cola North America. Prior to joining Coca-Cola, Valerie served as the Global Vice President, Human Resources, supporting Johnson & Johnson consumer supply chain and global quality. Valerie also served as Johnson & Johnson Vision Care Worldwide Vice President, Human Resources. Valerie joined Johnson & Johnson with over 20 years of finance, operations, labor relations, and HR experience. Valerie started her professional career, which I'm very glad to say, with General Motors, and during her 20-year tenure, she spent time in both local and international assignments where her levels of responsibility increased. Please help me welcome Valerie. And next to Valerie is Stacy Calvert, Vice President, Human Resources, GKN Aerospace. After years as a practicing employment lawyer, both as a litigator in a national law firm, as well as in-house legal counsel, partnering with HR professionals in the aerospace, technology, and manufacturing industries, Stacy took a new career path and moved into an HR role. She is currently VP of HR, for the North American Aerostructures business of GKN Aerospace. Prior to this role, she was with a private equity-owned global industrial manufacturing business as Corporate Director of Employee Relations and Division Vice President of HR, and previously held other roles in the legal and compliance function within the technology and manufacturing industries. Please help me wel welcome Stacy. And next to Stacy is Steve Hunt, Chief Expert. What a great name. Chief I want Chief Expert. How do you get Chief Expert? That's great. Chief Expert Technology and Work, SAP Success Factors. Dr. Hunt's work focuses on the design and deployment of technology-enabled processes to improve workforce agility, productivity, engagement, and well-being an industrial organizational psychologist and applied mathematician, he has played a central role in creating human resource solutions that have positively influenced millions of employees working for thousands of companies around the globe. A thought leader in the field of HR technology, he regular spe regularly speaks on topics related to the changing nature of jobs, organizations, talent management, and the experience of work. 
dr hunt has written hundreds of articles and several books on strategic h r methods please help me welcome steve hunt and finally but not least we have sharing a good good wine executive vice president human resources at wells fargo sharon is leading the enterprise talent team She's responsible for a holistic end-to-end -end view of enterprise talent planning, while she and her team ensure that they are well positioned to meet the needs of today and the future by fo focusing on trends for talent acquisition, development, planning, and organizational effectiveness from a team member life cycle perspective. The team also oversees the creation of talent-related products and tools. In her role, she and her team identified and capitalized on common advantage points, including talent intelligence, movement and development, diversity and inclusion, and long-term human capital strategies. Please help me welcome Sharon. Okay, I didn't mess that up too bad. I got through all those. That was very... Uh, I'm pretty proud of myself right now. <laughs> okay, but anyway, we're going to start off with the first question here. Again, the panel is about what is the best way to build bridges between human resources and the rest of the company. But really, I'm going to ask all the panelists to address this first question. What does senior management and the workforce at large need and want from human resources? And what does exceeding those expectations look like? So I'll start with you, Melissa. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for, for being here and uh, a great couple of days. Um, I, I think one of the things that uh, we often talk about, uh, the, the language of business, but I think the, the business and our workforce needs HR leaders who are speaking the business and not just talking to uh, peer HR colleagues, right? So getting out there, being able to understand how are things impacting the external world, the customers, uh, and really speaking in, in business speak um, and, and not just uh, HR speak. I think also this, you know, keeping up with the speed of change. Things are never going to get any easier or simpler, whether it's uh, regulatory processes to you name it that's going on. We all know and live with the, the macro and mega trends out there. And it's a collision. It's not one or two coming at any of us at any time, uh, at one time. So how do we balance uh, and, and continue to rebalance? Um, but, and I also think this external element, um, I, I think about the in increased demand of societal transparency and pressures that leaders and companies are under. Uh, they need HR leaders to be able to help navigate that. So if we think about in the US, um, ESG, environmental social governance, and you know, think about that on steroids. I, I, I know for myself, increasingly being called to talk to investors, to talk to analysts, and HR needs to shape uh, that narrative. And I think um, when we've exceeded uh, th those expectations, we will certainly have leaders who are, are at the bottom line able to lead culture and lead people with the same expectation that they lead their business, right? So I think when, when they have that mindset, we'll know we're there, as well as a, a high-performing um, culture and engaged workforce. Thank you, Melissa. Valerie. Yeah, just to build on what Melissa said, wow, that was powerful. <laughs> um, I was trying to take notes in my head. But what I would add to that, because Melissa brings up a really good point of how do we elevate that value proposition that we bring to business conversation? How do we ensure HR has a voice in, at the table? The best way to do that is to remain curious, really learning the business, understanding the P&L. There's value in getting around finance leaders and really understanding the P&L so that you can be more thoughtful about uh, what's going to drive the future growth of the business. Mm -hmm. Having those tools available to our business around organization agility, flexible workspace, thinking about uh, capabilities of the future, being very proactive and bringing that to the discussion really changes the conversation from not just a transactional organization, which was the historical perspective of HR, but we're more strategic players at the table. So I'd encourage us as an HR community to just 
make sure that our voice is showing up and we're coming with data insights to help drive very informed conversation about the future of organizations because i came to h r from a different function i really kind of had an outsider's view of what h r was for i guess and i was wrong about a hundred percent of it um, <laughs> but i've I, one of the things I noticed early on was uh, as a lawyer, somebody would complain about something and say something was wrong, we weren't doing something right. I would say, um, oh, let's solve that problem, right? I'm ready to solve that problem. Use my brain, my knowledge of the law, talking to other smart people, let's solve that problem. But when I was confronted with the same thing as an HR professional, I took it personally, like, you mean everybody's not happy working here? <laughs> <laughs> and so that was a, a little bit of a, of, of a transition to understand what was actually my job and what wasn't my job. And it, it, it was difficult and painful to learn that it wasn't to actually make people happy. Um, but one thing that I have, you know, I still get a lot of, we hear a lot of complaints in our roles mm -hmm. and only occasionally do we hear praise sometimes. <laughs> but the thing I think I've been the most consistently praised for is truth telling. And so to me, that is what is most needed from our profession is truth telling, not just acknowledging the elephant in the room, but stopping the discussion long enough to talk about the elephant and why the elephant may be stopping our progress uh, as a team. And I think we'll know when we've exceeded expectations, when we know what our leaders want and need before they know it themselves because as you pointed out we're so embedded with the business we understand what the business goals are and the strategies and also how they do the work that they do every day that we'll know it before they do wow um boy it's funny as i'm listening to you talk and i'm thinking of building bridges and i'm realizing this is like the oakland bay bridge that there's this part and then there's this part and then there's this part and there's multiple spans to this um my focus probably not surprisingly given who I work with SAP is looking sort of at this from a technology perspective because when I started out in this field technology was this weird thing in HR oh my gosh what is this computer thing you know and now HR is a technology field and you can't deploy any large-scale change into an organization without utilizing technology and the, I like to say the era of the three ring binder is over, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so when you look at, you know, the, there's all these sides of HR, you've got to be focused on supporting the business and being engaging, being upfront. But when you at the end of the day, the parts of HR that require getting people other than HR to do stuff, which is that we always say this needs to be owned by the business, a lot of the things we do. Well, that's where technology plays a huge role. And when I look at these systems and the role of HR, the problem is a lot of the way we implement processes, it takes people out of work. They're like, I'm working, I'm working, oh, I've got to do this HR thing. Mm -hmm. And when it takes them out of work, and then there's sort of two issues where I see this really happen in a lot of the way we design HR processes. One, there are some processes that people need to do, especially if you're a manager and employ people, that I like to call like the care and feeding of employees. Yes, it takes you out of work, but it's an important thing you need to do. Um, some of those, the way we design these processes, especially under self-service, quote, manager self-service, are processes that are so inefficient that we're like increasing people's blood pressure at scale. And it's interesting, we've done studies where we've gone and asked people, and asked people about self-service technologies and say, does this make you feel efficient, empowered, frustrated, or undervalued? And a lot of them are frustrated and undervalued. So I think we need to really make sure that when we deploy those sorts of systems, it doesn't mean they're gonna be easy. Doing things like a behavioral interview or a performance review of it shouldn't be simple, but it shouldn't feel like a waste of somebody's time. Mm -hmm. And the technology and the system should show people a sense that you appreciate my time and this is a good use of my time. It's not really inefficient or doesn't make sense to me. And I think on the other side, mm -hmm. where we're really talking about embedding HR practices into the business with better people management, we will never, I think, truly link HR to the business until we link HR systems to business systems. Mm -hmm. Business does not use HR systems. Now this is something where, you know, it's, I'm at SAP, that we're kind of on the forefront of this, but you're starting to see this change, really saying, 
how can we, rather than create a separate HR process, build HR techniques into existing business processes? And I'll just give one example, like one of our customers linked training into the supply chain technology so that when something is shipped to a store, employees automatically get the training. It's not viewed as a training program, it's viewed as a supply chain distribution mm -hmm. step, mm -hmm. which is changing the way they think about it. So I think mm -hmm. that's probably the biggest spam, but I think until we sort of realize that we need to get ourselves literally linked technologically to the business, it's gonna be really hard to do this in a sustainable manner. So I have the joy of being the last person to answer the question, <laughs> so I'm going to try not to repeat. But um, there are some things that are really key. And so the whole piece around being strategic, a lot of times that word is just thrown out. It's just that I'm very strategic. And it's like, well, what does that mean? What are you really being, like, what are you bringing to your business? Um, I really like to think about solutions oriented and simple because sometimes things can seem like they are this big, but when we really listen to what the need is, it's not that big. Mm -hmm. And so using some of the skills that I know that we're all good at is truly thinking about active listening so that we're answering the question, but then also anticipating what that next question may be so that we could get ahead of that. The last thing that I would say is also around um, the integration. And so you were hitting on some of that too, Steve, just around integration um, of technology. And I think it's integration of our work from a holistic standpoint as well, so that it doesn't feel like it is something extra to the, even the example that you just gave. It's just a part of the process. And so if we really listen to what our leaders are saying, thinking about the knowledge that we have of the business, and putting our subject matter expertise to work, it's really around being that trusted advisor and giving that advice that is going to help to move a business forward versus feeling like we're doing something to them to make it stall. Very good. Well, to move on, I guess the next kind of question that we should ask um, is why do some employees and departments seek to limit engagement with human resources and what motivates that reluctance <laughs> and institutional inertia. So uh, I think Stacy, I was gonna start off with you on this one. I, I think very often that we're considered a center of bureaucracy and not a center of excellence. Yeah. And that is a really across all HR sub-functions uh, um, and uh, I think we have to own that reputation and, uh, and understand how we got there. And then, and then only then can we sort of climb our way out of that hole. And, and the other thing I would say is, and, and, and I, I try to look for this uh, in, my, in, in myself and in my team as well. Um, I think people view HR as hypocritical sometimes that we have all these great policies and processes out there but then we might be the one to sit in a meeting where a leader is behaving in an abusive fashion or otherwise not in accordance with the culture we want to build and the HR person is silent. And there's been, there have been too many examples, mm -hmm. big and small, of things like that that people see and it, it sinks in and we have, to, we have to own that as well. I think, that's, I think that's a really good point. I think it was interesting because I was in, at lunch in a group of talking about building an HR function in small companies, and we were chatting a little bit about, you know, what it is to build an HR function versus a large one. And I think some of the problems with employees is to the point of not knowing HR. One, we need to give them technology that is easier to use, but also we have to not hide behind it. And that's what I'm also seeing happening in a lot of HR is, you know, I've worked for small smart startups, and a small startup, the HR person knows everyone, and they're like, an, and they're the person who's an expert in people. You know, so like if somebody's struggling with whatever issue, um, that HR person's kind of known that way. Kind of like the IT person is like everyone goes with their IT issues. And I think with a lot of employee groups, we impose processes they find to be bureaucratic, but at the same time, we don't spend enough time getting out and just talking to people. And I think that's part of a structure, and I think we had such a move to HR efficiency, reduce the size of HR staff, blah, 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 which I get, but then suddenly, I mean, I know companies where it's like, well, you're not a high enough level to actually get to talk to an HR person. <laughs> I mean, literally. 
It's like you have to file a ticket through the Philippines or something like that. Nothing against the Philippines. But the, when you think about it, a lot of the people where they build that thing, where they probably need the most help is probably like you know, first level managers, yet they don't have the access. Mm -hmm. So and that would be an issue, I'd say. You know, I'm, it reminds me of a story, and probably, uh, Valerie, you lived through some of it at General Motors. Um, uh, our chairman and CEO, Mary Barra, when she was the head of HR, she actually changed our dress policy, which happened to be like a 20-page document. I haven't seen it because that's no longer <laughs> exists, but to the bureaucracy point. And she changed it to two, world, two words, dress appropriately. And that was it. So basically tried to eliminate that bureaucracy. So Melissa, Valerie, Sharon, do you guys have anything to add on this question? Yeah, I think the only thing that I would add is that HR has evolved. And so when we think about HR and how people utilize HR, it, like it is gonna be different. So you may have people that are coming in and wanting to call in for something that's payroll related and they never use HR again for anything else. Mm -hmm. But then we think on the other side of HR where it's really being that um, advisor that's giving the real truth about what's happening and not being that yes person to a leader, but really telling them what they need to hear. And so I think it is part of our responsibility to help to move forward in helping companies to think about HR in different ways as well, but also recognizing that everyone is not going to use HR at the same time in the same way. Yeah, and I, my comment goes back to what Sharon was saying earlier about simplification. I think a lot of times when HR introduces new policies, procedures, program, it comes with so much complexity mm -hmm. that businesses are like, wait a minute, one more initiative or one more thing we have to do in addition to all the priorities we have around driving growth in the business, that if we could just keep things simple uh, and drive consistency across whatever region we're in or whatever part of the business we're in, that, that just uh, invites us to be able to lean into uh, conversations a little bit more with the business. Yeah, I agree with the, the, the simplicity as well as, um, yeah, it's about trust and it's no different than we should expect any other leadership team. But if you're part of an HR uh, leadership team, we, we should act in a way that we expect um, and elicit trust. And that takes getting to know people and being approachable and listening and um, being very intentional on the ways that we're engaging with the total workforce. And I think sometimes the, the behaviors in HR structures uh, perpetuate the silo. So whether you're in shared, shared service or operations or a business partner or a COE, mm -hmm. and that's kind of all we know and speak to. And But what about joint or shared mm -hmm. uh, ownership mm -hmm. in the ways that we act and can talk about each other's respective functions, even within HR at that one company? Yeah. So. I just think it's funny as you're talking, I think if the only time employees talk to HR is when there's a problem, you're going to be thought of as a problem. Good point. <laughs> okay, well, well, moving on to our third question, talking about how the soft skills of change management and effective communications are must-have competencies for HR executives. So that's kind of what we want to yeah. kind of talk about now and kind of shift the discussion to. And uh, Sharon, I'll start off with you. Yeah. You always seem to be the last one. I've okay, with you this awesome. Time. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, what I would say is that communication is key. And so, I know I've been um, the recipient of some communications that have eight attachments in it and embedded in that last message is really what you need to know. And so, when we think about the end user in mind around what is it that we want to get from a communication and making sure that that is, you know, kind of bright, bold, and sticking out. That makes a huge difference. Um, the other thing that I would say too, just around some of the soft skills and when we think about change management, you know, have been um, in situations before where sometimes it feels as if the change management stops with the communication. And sometimes that's really where the change management begins. Because if we think about the longer horizon around where we're going, getting people on that journey is gonna be really key and so really paying attention to what feedback we're giving, finding different vehicles that people can feel like they're in a safe space to give that feedback, and also making sure that things that are being told to us, that we're actually taking them into consideration as we think about future iterations of a process or a tool. 
but I think communication as well as paying attention and really having an environment where getting perspectives and feedback matters so that we're integrating that into um, our future work really matters. Yeah. Stacy. One of the um, one of the practices that I brought with me from other roles is is um, I I always create talking points. Anytime I'm preparing for a difficult conversation, I'm helping prepare somebody else for a difficult conversation. I ask myself, what am I most worried somebody is going to ask me? And then if I can answer that question at all, I'll feel more prepared going into that conversation. And so this is something that I've tried to um, help my colleagues with, my, my senior leaders with, you know, ask yourself, what are, the, what are the hard questions? What are you worried about being asked? What do you stay up at night worrying about? Mm -hmm. um, what do you think maybe we're being disingenuous about? If you can answer that question, then you're ready to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that, that aspect of communication is mm -hmm. having those difficult conversations. It's just a huge part of mm -hmm. what we do and helping others to have those difficult conversations in a, in a productive way so that we can then um, move forward in a, in, a positive, in a more positive way and not just keep stewing in the same, in the same negative stuff. And on the, the change management piece, um, we've really started to um, emphasize that more and more in, at the recruiting stage to ask people questions that are designed to elicit their attitude about change. How flexible are they? How comfortable are they in an environment where uh, the answers aren't written down yet, or there may not even be any guidelines or policies for them to read in a three ring binder on the first day of work. Um, because that's most likely the environment that they could be coming into. And if, if, they, if they really prefer a different kind of environment, I'd like to know that before we hire them. Mm -hmm. what, I would, I'm sorry. what I would add to that is, you know, much to what Stacy and Sharon were saying, it's the power of storytelling. Bringing people along for the journey and making sure that we can explain the why of whatever is happening in the organization and making sure we've got the right communication and change management team from the beginning of the journey so that they can help craft the right messaging. Because oftentimes I've found if we don't have the right storytelling along the way, employees will start to finish the story. And oftentimes it's not with the right data and facts and it impacts engagement. We can't people keep people focused on the work that matters most if they're busy trying to figure out what's really happening. So if we do a better job of telling the story with integrity and trust, mm -hmm. people, even with the, the tough messages, people will get okay with, okay, this is a tough decision, a tough direction of the organization because they understand the why. So I encourage the communication, the storytelling to make sure people understand uh, different parts of the journey. Yeah. I, I think when we were talking chatting a little bit the, this morning with the panel, I think in change, when I look at change management, I think there's two types. There's one you're talking about, which is the difficult change, the culture change, where you really need to engage with people. But on the other type of change management, which is, I wrote a book called Common Sense Talent Management. And the reason I called it Common Sense Talent Management is as a psychologist, I was amazed how much stuff is so basic common sense. Like, you know, people are more likely to do what you want them to do if they know what it is you want them to do. Wow. <laughs> That's why goals aren't important, you know? This is not cutting edge psychology. Um, yet you find a lot of companies, for example, that don't do a lot of these common sense things. And a lot of this is, I would say, is due to the processes we used to use. We had very cumbersome processes, very bureaucratic processes. And now with technology, one of our customers said this to me a few years ago, and at first I was like, no, that's heresy. He said, you know, in the modern digitalized world, the technology, if it's intuitive to use and it makes sense, is the change management. He said, when, if LinkedIn changes their app, there's no change management program. We just look at it and we figure it out and we move on. And, and he said, that's kind of the digitalized world. And I, I don't think that applies to like culture change, but for a lot of the things that HR is involved in. And what I've seen, I really thought about that, I started looking at our customers' work in this area and companies doing this, 
that if, let's, I'll use the goal management example. I have seen companies work for years to try to get employees to set goals and it never worked. I have seen other companies do it in less than two months from nothing. And the difference was they had a really clear process and they communicated it this way. Basically, the CEO said, I want people to know what my goals are and I want to know how your goals link to my goals. So here are my goals. <laughs> mm -hmm. You set your goals and show how they link to my goals. And it was simple and it just, there was no, there was no employee that's like, well, why would they want to know what I'm doing and how it ties to their goals? It was so obvious the value of this and the system was so simple that, yeah, there were people that set weird goals initially. <laughs> one person was lose, one person literally lose 15 pounds. It's like, well, it's probably not. <laughs> but, um, but I was, when I looked at that, I was struck that a lot of change management, often we create our own problems on these process things because we, one, we make it too complicated, and two, we don't get leadership behavior. The key thing for that story, why this company was so successful, is was the CEO was the first person to put the goals in the system. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't anybody who could say, I don't have time for this. Mm -hmm. Well, good stuff. All right, we're gonna go into our fourth question. Um, discussing ways to win hearts and minds throughout a company through championing successes, embracing the lessons learned from failures, a commitment to ongoing training and learning opportunities, and always creating a clear path forward for your workforce. So, you know, kind of the premise here is hearts and minds. How do we do that with all the things that are important to us in HR? So, mm -hmm. Valerie, do you want to start with that? Sure. When I think about organizations that have really made an advancements in the space of creativity and innovation. It's all about creating that vulnerability around learning fast from your failures and failing forward. Uh, because I think that really creates the atmosphere of what the organization needs to drive that innovation. So we, we have within, and I'll start with Johnson & Johnson, where we first implemented a program called Faster Forward, where we ask leaders to share their stories about when they've had experience of failure what they learn from it, and how they leverage that to, to continue to progress in the organization. Because I think our employees are smart, bright, but they're less likely to take a risk because they're concerned about what are the implications of failure. But when you create that safe space uh, for those opportunities, you can really see some of those bold thinking, bold initiatives that come forward. And that's what drives the growth in an organization. So, it starts with us being able to tell our stories around our vulnerability, and boy, have I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> I've tried to make sure they weren't mistakes that put us on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, but I've made mistakes. And when uh, my team and my colleagues, my peers hear me talk about that, they're less likely to say, I'm, I, I won't take that risk. So I think one of the things that we can do is just create that white space of the unknown and create that opportunity for risk taking. Yeah, I, I agree with, with that. The, um, we, we learned a lot, if I go back over the past decade, uh, some years ago in agriculture in Monsanto, we acquired a startup company in Silicon Valley. And we learned how to um, fail fast, learn, but more importantly, as a bigger company, and as a company becomes uh, greater on scale, and now you fast forward to bear 100, com 100 countries, 125,000 employees around the world, when you manage the ability of speed and risk and failure, failing fast and learning and relearning, um, it really comes from that place of um, data, information, and even transparency before you jump to accountability. I think that helps with speed to decision, right? A leader can, can make a decision faster with 80-20 as opposed to no data, no ana analytics, um, and yet we want them to make a decision where that's where they want the 100 page fully decked out everything uh, under the sun before they uh, uh, make a decision quickly. So we, we learned some things um, hanging out with startup companies and, and tech companies and, and, uh, and the type of talent um, that those companies have. 
Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a piece. I think the personal storytelling is huge, and I think you nailed it. What gets in the way? We learned a lot about what gets in the way of leaders being out there, and it is the vulnerability piece. Mm -hmm. So you sometimes have to have those one-on-one -on -one uh, safe places to coach other executives in, you know, here's a starting point with a story that maybe you're more comfortable being vulnerable. Um, and then getting to the place of, wow, this is, was a big one and I really uh, learned from a, a significant mistake. But that those places of comfort to help people um, get to that place of greater vulnerability. And, and, we, and taking the bold moves, you know, that, that part of that question was about um, learning and, and you know we we took an approach to say you yeah, know there's a lot of great learning programs from this internal university this to the places we would send people to um, but let's really take a pause and reimagine learning mm -hmm. and let's reimagine it and from a place of digital and data and not everything has to only be afforded to a few people that's a 12-month program or this month program but how do we start from a place of we want uh, learning and, and e-learning and digital learning in the moment to be accessible for any and everyone. Mm -hmm. So let's pause to reimagine and recreate. And over the course of nine to 12 months, we did that with a new delivery program. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So Sharon, Stacy, or Steve, do you have anything to add on this question? the only thing that I would add, um, and I guess just by way of hands, how many people have been through a merger, or acquisition, a divestiture? I'll raise my, if I had everything, I'll raise them up. But um, the reason I say that is because there are starts and stops. Mm -hmm. So you may be at a company for 15 years and you're used to doing it one way. And when we think about the hearts and minds and all of a sudden, you know, bam, there's the announcement and two companies have come together. So you're bringing together two different cultures, maybe leadership styles, what matters, maybe funding is different. You know, it all comes together, but it may not be in the exact way that you may have imagined it before. And so the reason that I wanted to use that as an example is just because when we talk about hearts and minds, we have the opportunity to reinvent ourselves with re-engaging our hearts and minds of all of our employees because change is going to happen. And it's about how do we go about creating the space, the safe space, but also thinking about um, what it is that we really need to do. And so that whole idea of sometimes pausing to go faster is really important because understanding just what we have also gives room for space to say, well, what do we want to be? It may not necessarily be what either company had or what we've done before, um, but engaging in that way and really hearing and understanding where we're going really gets to that piece around the hearts and minds and people feeling like they're a part of something, that they belong there. Um, yeah, I think as we're talking about dealing with this change and the people's willingness to like how they respond to change. Like, we can't stop change. It's not, like, change is coming. It's more how do people react to it. And I was struck as you were chatting a little bit about being transparent, being vulnerable, getting employees, was there was a, a great session, <coughs> but General Mills just prior to this great session on sort of transforming their manufacturing workforce. And what really struck me in that was the woman shared that you have to believe in people. You have to demonstrate a belief in people and then we, had, we were talking a little bit about people still having resistance of, well, if, why, why should I learn new stuff? You should pay me more. And it's like, well, no, you should learn new stuff because otherwise your job will disappear. And she, she shared, we need transparency. She said the, play, the plants where we had the most success were we very transparent about the business situation. You know, include sharing that, hey, th there's uncertainty in the future of this plan. And I, I think that when you do these two things, which are, Building confidence by truly believing in people and making the investment. You're so not training for some, but everyone can be better. Everyone. So that's truly believing in everyone in the company and demonstrating that through how you treat them. Mm -hmm. But also building commitment by through transparency and awareness. Um, when you're talking about acquisitions, I was struck with one company I worked with that they had to do a major restructuring because of the market change. And what they did is they said in November, in June, we have to take out 10% of our workforce costs, seven months from now. Mm -hmm. And they said, we're telling you this now because 
if you're about to buy a new house, this might not be a good time to do it. <laughs> Hold off. And we're going to go through a process, and they kind of shared the process they're going to do. But the commitment that they showed to their employees to say, we're not going to hide this from you for fear that, oh, you might leave. We're going to be upfront about it. We know it's mm -hmm. coming. Mm -hmm. And if we want you to be committed to us through this change, we have to be committed to you in telling you what change is coming. I, to me, that was real leadership vulnerability. Yeah. Just a reading recommendation if you want to read more on the topic of leadership vulnerability. Brene Brown's Dare to Lead is really very good on that topic. It's been out a year or two, but if you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend it. <clears throat> Okay, well, we've exhausted the questions for the panel. Uh, let's give it up for the panel. They're great, right? <laughs> okay, I do know we have some uh, microphones that can be, uh, if you have questions to ask the panel, please, and they're walking through the aisles now. One here. I know that you uh, just shared about some resources as it relates to Brene Brown's book, but I, uh, merger and acquisition seems like everybody's been through some form of that. Any incredible tools that really have helped uh, shape thinking in terms of walking through the merger and acquisition process? So, so I wish I could come up with something that wasn't off the shelf. <laughs> However, a few things that come to mind. Um, having been on both sides of them and also worked with businesses that were acquiring or divesting a business. Um, a few key things that have really helped, especially in consulting with the leadership teams, have been around thinking about the business and being crystal clear. So it's kind of like that elevator speech that sometimes people say, like, what are you saying about your business, your company? that you want everyone to walk away with and making sure that there's some agreement on what that is so that it can start that change process even a little bit earlier. Um, another thing that I have found um, to be really helpful, so I love the piece around the, authentic, the authenticity as well as the transparency, is because um, it can be very difficult to say, I don't know. But it can also be very powerful to say, I don't know, this is the journey, these are the steps that we're taking, this is what we do know, but these are some things that we're trying to figure out. Um, and then I guess the third thing that I have found that have worked, that has worked, is also just, um, and it goes a little bit to the soft skills, which is around treating people the way that you would want to be treated, which goes to care, it goes to humble, you never know what side of the coin you're going to be on at any given time um, in your career. But really thinking about that from the standpoint of, um, you know, giving the context, you know, listening to, you know, what people are saying and answering versus walking in with what you feel like you want to say all the time. Um, sometimes that can create a dynamic, but really just figuring out how to coach people on that. Depending on the situation, there definitely are leadership tools and leadership books and things that you may even have at your companies that are really, really helpful. Um, but it's hard to say that there's a one size fit all, but those are some of the things that have worked in my past as I think through being in a merger or an acquisition, but then also helping to lead a leader through change um, in the merger or acquisition. I am. Um... I feel, I love, you know, I think this is panels, we all have different perspectives and they're, I'm like, they're all right. I'm like, wow, that's awesome too. I have a completely, I agree with everything you said, and, but I, I, something different area of the skin is not really basic, accurate data. Well, that's really. <laughs> and, and it's one of the things, this was really, a, you know, through my work, I've had a chance to work with like hundreds of companies that are using technology in different ways. And one of the things that was a really aha moment was one of our one of the companies I was working with that had just gone through massive restructuring said, um, you know, one of the most transformational tools we had was, and this, is, um, and this doesn't have to be SAP, I, I hope it always is, but was basically saying linking their payroll technology to their core HR technology to their talent technology. Because the person said, because the technology was linked to payroll, it was accurate. <laughs> but because it was linked to talent, we actually knew what people were doing. Mm -hmm. 
And we had, we had this ability very quickly, we had off signs these things, you have to take costs out of the organization very quickly sometimes. Mm -hmm. We had the ability to actually know where people were, what they were doing, the implications of different costs you know, of changes. And the person said, you know, it used to be we would just lop off whole lines of a column of Excel and pray that nobody in there was valued talent till we had to hire them back as contractors. <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> not that that's ever no. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of joking, but I'm not. I'm not at the same time. That happens in these things a lot, and it's because we don't. If you're a really big company, it's hard to know who's in your company. It's a challenge, and so getting make sure you have that good data before you need it. Yeah, and I would just add to that, um, and this is probably a, um, a no-brainer, is around the due diligence that goes along with making sure that as you're acquiring or merging or even divesting an organization is that you really pay attention to the details because especially with acquisitions and mergers is understanding what the integration would look like and when you're gonna integrate two companies and understand the cultures within each company and making sure you're mindful of the people that are being impacted with the change. Are you looking at their pay structures? Are you looking at policies and procedures of two companies? That's like you're, someone was saying, you're marrying two different entities and really being purposeful and intentional about what that looks like so that everyone can be excited about what the new is, what the change is. So I would just encourage uh, to the point of the data is just making sure the right due diligence is happening mm -hmm. early. We, we once um, laid off the person who paid the phone bill for the corporate office and we found that out when the phone shut off. <laughs> <laughs> Due diligence. Due diligence. <laughs> uh, apparently that was the only person who knew anything about it whatsoever. If, you are re if you're referring to more um, process checklist kind of things, um, I have, um, I've had to pull a lot of that stuff together. Uh, you know, when I was confronted with a new situation that I hadn't, you know, in M&A that I hadn't dealt with before, and uh, SHRM has been a very important resource for me. And then they also have their kind of ask, ask an expert hotline that you can call and talk to them about specific topics. And so when I just need a basic grounding or a checklist, I, I almost always start there. And then I kind of move out from there to get more, drill down more, more deeply into uh, significant issues. I would, I would add one minor thing to my data too, include contractors. In a lot of companies, your contractors are performing mission critical functions. Mm -hmm. True. And when you do things like acquisitions, so have good data on who your contractors are and what they're doing as well. Thank you all for the discussion. Um, Melissa and Valerie, both of you talked about the power of storytelling. So I was curious as to, this is for everyone on the panel, what your organizations have done or how you've leveraged the power of storytelling to make an impact? Um, well, well, quickly, one of the things that we've done is we've incorporated that as part of an inclusive leadership skilling. So ultimately, all of our people leaders will go through such a program, but they learn uh, the tools on how to do it and how to do it from the place of connecting um, leading people and leading cultures in a story just as much as you would lead your business. So connecting the two, and, and so we really kind of train on how to do that. Mm -hmm. That's one element. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say that's, that was a big part of our organizations prepared, preparing our leaders to tell stories. We even use TED Talks a lot. Mm -hmm. How do you tell a very succinct story in a very meaningful way and being able to show a little bit of emotion behind it to make it mm -hmm. real. So it's not just mm -hmm. telling a story for the sake of telling it, but put it into a real life scenario. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of training has gone on because that is not a natural skill mm -hmm. for people to be able to tell a story and make it so that the, uh, the receiving end understands mm -hmm. what the common, what the, the clear content is uh, that's being conveyed. So I think training, and training and more practice at it, uh, even in your day jobs, even if it's not about a big communication around change, but storytelling and even if you're trying to pitch uh, a new initiative or a new approach to doing something, how do you tell it in a very succinct way? That's one of the um, other things that I would add to is also using some of our internal websites 
Um, so sometimes the storytelling is verbal, meaning standing up, or you need to have that engagement one-on-one. -on -one. But also storytelling can be written as well. And so through some of our, um, in, th through our internal website, we're able to reach all of our employees by um, having employees across the company be able to tell stories as well. Um, so it's another way to engage across all levels and also make sure that we are working across and sharing the experiences of many. Any other questions? We, uh, we were talking about employee safety in a leadership meeting and this is gonna this is gonna freak you out but we actually put people in a room and we blindfolded them and put earphones on them so that all they could do was listen to stories being told by our employees real people about mental health issues because what we were trying to do is talk we, we talk a lot about physical safety we're in manufacturing it's very important but we don't talk a lot about emotional safety and emotional well-being mm -hmm. and mental health issues and so this the idea was to really make an impact around that and people hearing real people talk about struggling with depression or anxiety or other mental health issues and how it affected them at work and what mm -hmm helped them and didn't help them about their manager or their interactions with their employees. We had a lot of people say it's the most significant right. thing that's ever happened to them as a manager. Uh, it. So th that, th that felt very risky to me. Well, first of all, I just didn't like the idea of people being blindfolded. I don't know, that just really <laughs> freaked me out a little bit. But I have to say, you know, the idea behind it was to truly make you focus and make you feel vulnerable at the same time. And so I found that to be one of the most powerful storytelling episodes that I've, that I've ever experienced. What wasn't my idea, but I, I really thought it was great. Excellent. Thanks. Okay, well, I think we're just about at time here. Actually, I finished on time, which is, I think, my only role as moderator <laughs> to do that. So I, uh, I've been able to successfully do that. <laughs> <laughs> And please, one more time for our panelists, Melissa, Valerie, Stacy, Steve, and Sharon. Thank you.